Good morning. All right. Um, somebody suggested I wear a wetsuit today because of the background. I decided not to. You're welcome. But I'm excited. VBS is right around the corner, kids. And by the way, parents, if you've not uh, registered your child, you probably need to do that. We only have a few spots left. And if you know of somebody in your neighborhood who wants to come, make sure you talk to them about it because this is going to be a lot of fun. Um, so we're at the very end of our series on Hebrews today. And this has been a very, uh, very challenging series for me. And I'm, I'm still going through the content with our, uh, like a, it's a men's Bible study that, that we have every Wednesday at noon in our conference room in the uh, business side of the uh, over there where the offices are I don't know what I was about to say it just but it's going to be uh, we're going to be kind of digging in a little deeper and we're I think we're only in chapter eight so if you're interested come on over it'll be a lot of fun uh, but today we're ending our series uh, so I'm going to start with this uh, when I was 14 years old I was invited to run a track meet, to go to a track meet. Um, you know, I was uh, going to run the, it's a 4 by 100 Is that, is that what it, this 4 by 100 you go all the way around? Right. So that was my event. And I was pretty athletic. You know, I participated in football. I participated in uh, basketball. I uh, participated in baseball. What I never really ever participated in was track. But I was pretty athletic and I thought I could handle it. So the race comes, I'm the third leg, because they have that much confidence in me. And when it was my turn, I ran fast for about 30 seconds. <laughs> then I realized as I'm starting to slow down that this was a race that I had neither prepared for or knew how to run at all. Um, it took everything my 14 year old body had to finish that race. And uh, I realized after that that racing, racing requires self-discipline. Uh, practice is good. Um, racing requires, um, I would say, the necessity of knowing why you're actually running. You know, we were well ahead before I got there. And we were at the very end whenever I finished. Now, meanwhile, around the same time frame, halfway across the world there is a young boy who knew exactly why he was running. You know, he had to if he was going to get to school on time. He lived on a farm in the middle of the country, and when it came time for him to start to go to school, he did what every other kid in his neighborhood would do. They would have to travel two miles there to school and back each and every day. Um, he'd walk two miles there, walk two miles back, and at the uh, end of the day, he will have to walk all the way back home just so he could help his parents with his chores. Four miles a day, at least five days a week. Of course, he was a little boy, you know, he had energy. But this little kid loved to run. Absolutely loved. So instead of walking, he would run the two miles there, and he'd run the two miles back. Now when he got a little older he took a job delivering milk and the problem was that the milk was in the next town over so he got a bicycle and he would bike to get the milk and his route all said and done was 24 miles. So every day he would run two miles to school run two miles home get on his bike and start biking for 24 miles every day to earn money because his family needed it. So when he's 16 years old, he comes across this former Olympic, uh, Olympic runner and he sees him and he says, hey, there's something different about you. There's a potential here for greatness. So he begins to coach him. And since that moment, Eliud Kupchogi has been running and he has run. He's run countless races and marathons. He had the chance to go to the Olympics in 16 and 2020. Both times he won gold. This little farm boy started running so many years ago, and he has not looked back. He's lived a disciplined life. He's lived a life of learning the limits of his own body and mind. Every morning, still, he gets up endures the weather, endures the adversity, keeping his eyes on the reason that he runs. 
He knows exactly why he's running. He's running to make history, to show that no human is limited. For him, it's not about the money. It's about showing a generation of people that there are no limits. Now, in verses 1 through 3 of Hebrews chapter 12, the preacher, the author, reminds us we are running a race as well. Every single one of us. So today, as we kind of move to the end of this series, I want to encourage you to keep your eyes on Jesus, no matter the weather, no matter the adversity, no matter how difficult things may get. Remember why you run and who you are running towards. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we are thankful for today. Help us to be a people who remember why we journey Lord, I pray that you would help us to be a people who continue to remember, Lord, even, even beyond our, our time together of communion where, where we remember your sacrifice, beyond the times when we gather with believers. Help us to remember each and every moment we wake, each and every moment our head hits the pillow, who has kept us and sustained us for that day. Help us to remember the goal, the point of all of this. And I pray, Lord, that you would strengthen us, knowing that through difficulty, we are learning. In Jesus' name, amen. So keeping your eyes on Jesus is a great thing to say. But it's not always an easy thing to do, especially whenever things get difficult. And let's be honest, things seem to be getting more difficult each and every day. Am I right? Um, life is a struggle. In fact, that's one of the things we've talked a lot about in this particular series is life is a struggle. Uh, and if it's a struggle for us who are in relative utopia where you know, we've got this idea of, of, of choice and we have uh, expendable cash, some of us. You know, we've got options, we've got uh, opportunities to educate and, and to grow and to learn. If, if life is hard in our country where things are relatively good, how hard must it have been for this audience that this preacher was writing to? You know, this early Christian group, they're hearing what this author is saying, and they know it was difficult. You know, it wasn't just a struggle uh, with the culture of people who didn't necessarily agree with them or, or know why they were doing what they were doing. It wasn't just a, a struggle against culture. It was a struggle with sin. So he says this in verse 4, and I'm just going to have you maybe kind of look through to find what that slide is. I think some of these are, are jumbled. Verse 4, it says, In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And have you completely forgotten this word of encouragement that addresses you as a father addresses his son. It says, my son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline and do not lose heart when he rebukes you because the Lord disciplines the one he loves and he chastens everyone he accepts as his son. Now, when I hear the word for discipline, I immediately remember the words that no child ever wants to hear. Wait till your father gets home. Maybe it's, I heard that a lot. But that's what I hear when I hear the word discipline. It meant something bad is about to happen. Usually because something bad did just happen. But for the longest time, I saw discipline in a negative light. And, and, and I know some people, I, I know some people who were disciplined simply because their parents were having a bad day. You know, they didn't have a dog to kick, so they kicked their kids. I don't know if that's necessarily discipline or abuse. But I know this idea for many of God as a disciplinarian, it's kind of hard to stomach. Not a lot of people really like that image. But when I approached this chapter, I started to really, I don't know, I dove deep and tried to understand what is this saying? Because he uses that word discipline a lot in this chapter. So I started looking at word choice. I started looking at, at context. So in verses 3 through 11, he uses discipline a lot in the, the different forms, but, but the root word here is called, it's paideia. Okay, if you can find that for me, just kind of click on that slide. 
It's called it's paideia, right? Uh, it's, it's a form of it. Now, it, it can mean punishment, but it is a much larger concept in the Greek culture. And I say Greek culture because even though Rome was the dominant power of the day, it was all influenced by Greek domination well before then. You know, the Greeks were very brilliant, and they didn't just come in and wipe everything out. They came in, they conquered, they, they you know, make sure that the, the best and smartest were educated. They, they sent up centers for learning. And, uh, you know, this is something that we still do is Greek styles of education in a lot of ways. They created cities that served as centers of culture. You know, paideia is this, is this idea of education or learning. But it's not just reading and writing and arithmetic. It's a full immersion into the language and uh, poetry, music, arts, culture, math, science, ethics, gymnastics. The goal for the Greeks was to form a perfect human citizen that, that would act to help improve the, the community and the nation. You know, the Greek society built a foundation of learning that has followed ever since. This is the concept of education in the Greek world. It's a whole formation of culture, a formation of a human. So, for example, you become Greek by reading Homer, not Simpson. That you become something else if you read Homer. No, like the Iliad, you know, the Odyssey. You know, you become, you become Jewish by reading and investigating Torah. It's culture. You know, as many of you know, as we entered this last week of school, for some of us, some of us have already had it, learning is really hard. It takes a lot of time, effort, engagement. Now, this idea here, as we've kind of gone all the way through Hebrews, this idea of learning here, this is the idea that connects what Christ endured and ultimately became, and it connects that to discipleship in Hebrews. Okay, it's education through suffering and education hurts right it, it's not easy to change the way you think about something even something that maybe you thought you had a pretty good grasp on for a while to change the way you think about that because of of, of, of a change in learning or, or because you, you see more data that's hard it's very difficult but to learn is to suffer you know, Jesus suffered because he was learning how to be a son of God. This is interesting. Jesus suffered. He learned, uh, suffered because he was learning how to be a son of God. So in Hebrews 2.10, remember I said this a little while back, the preacher says, in bringing many sons and daughters to glory, it was fitting that God, for whom and through whom everything exists, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through what he suffered. In Hebrews 5, Jesus, his life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with fervent cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Submission is hard to learn, y'all. Son, though he was, he learned obedience through what he suffered. Now, there's an ancient conviction concerning education especially Greek, right? To learn is to suffer. Here's a fun Greek phrase you can say. It's a, a matheo pathean, no pain, no gain. Learning is hard. And sometimes that's the only way you really know that you've learned something is if you've endured. Jesus suffered because he was learning how to be a son of God. What if that were true for us? Now, gift, difficulty is not a matter of if. It's a matter of when. How will you choose to face it? Now, if you knew that you were learning how to be a member of the royal family, if you knew that, that all the things you were going through and, and Grant, I don't, I don't ascribe to that. There's a reason for everything, okay? I, I differ. I know some people differ with me. But I do think that God can redeem our suffering. He 
transforms it into something that will help us become more like him what if everything we're going through the difficulty is is teaching you how to be a, a member of god's family could you manage the difficulty and the hardship with more resolve and more purpose Now let me remind you here, our journey does not end once you choose to follow Jesus. All right, salvation is is when the learning really begins. Difficulty is its own teacher, but the preacher, he knows that the people are going through something. So he reminds us, and I'm gonna gonna read through this here, and and I'm gonna kind of switch this, this uh, discipline with education educate because I think that this is kind of what he's getting at and this is what he says he says endure hardship as discipline or education God is, is treating you as his children for what children are not disciplined or educated by their father if you're not educated and everyone undergoes education and discipline then you are not legitimate not true sons and daughters at all moreover we have all had human fathers who have disciplined or educated us and we respected them for it how much more should we submit to the father of spirits and live they disciplined or educated us for a little while as they thought it best but God disciplines educates us for our good in order that we may share in his holiness now no discipline or education seems pleasant at the time but painful later on however it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it there's some tenderness in these words here Now, a good father is one who will take time with his children, who uh, will protect them and care for them and give them their basic needs. A good father is one who does his best to train his children in goodness and kindness, to prepare them with the tools that they need to face a difficult world. And the world is difficult. Pain is real. Sickness is real. Violence is very real. Evil is very present. But those very real realities do not have to control us or define us. A good father prepares you for the difficulty. He gives you tools not only to manage, but to press through, to overcome. Now, we've, we've endured difficulty. I've endured difficulty. And I, I know in the past, in some of these moments, I will think instinctively, what would my dad do? Well, what would my father-in-law have done? Now, to be disciplined is to be consistent with the things you've learned even when it hurts, even when it may seem impossible. Now, and I'll say that no Athenian Greek, those, those early Greeks who really kind of instituted this idea, they, they never believed knowledge could ever exist for any other purpose than to lead you to right action. You know, they're not just storing up knowledge so they can zing you whenever they want to make you feel bad about yourself. No, knowledge was always meant to be lived and enacted and and in right action so if we're following Jesus our learning should do exactly the same thing it should always lead to right action learning should never lead to condemnation our learning with God should never lead us to judgment or oppression our father is teaching us that in his kingdom love is the proper response Even when some people may seem too difficult to love, love is the proper response. We know we can give uh, love to people. We know we can give forgiveness to people. We know we can accept because that's what God's done with us. We've seen Jesus do this, this very same thing. He's forgiven the world with his sacrifice, with his own blood, his life. And not only that, Hebrews tells us he continues to speak to God on our behalf daily, moment by moment. He is speaking to God as our mediator, as our high priest, 
his love and his sacrifice have opened the door for all of us, not just to squeak into heaven, but to be his brothers and sisters. In this journey we're on, we're running to God. And the only way to get to God is if you're hand in hand with Jesus. So keep your eyes on him. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Because Jesus is at the finish line. He, uh, you know, was perfected. Just as God perfected Jesus and his faith and his obedience, he is seeking to do the exact same thing for all of us. So keep your eyes on Jesus. Jesus is at the finish line. And not only is Jesus our mediator, not only is he our high priest, he is the last, final, and perfect sacrifice. He has ensured salvation for all of us, ensuring that all of us have the ability to become sons and daughters of God himself if we were just to believe and run to him. So keep your eyes on Jesus. He is at the finish line. Run with everything you have. And please remember, we do not run alone. I've said this before, but the Hebrews preacher tells us too, we are surrounded by such a cloud of witnesses. Those who have gone before, those who have run before, those who have kept this, this hope as an anchor for the, for the soul, firm and secure, as it says in, in chapter 6, verse 19. Chapter 11 was this heroes of faith list. These are people that we all aspire to be like, but very few of them, none of them ever realized the hope, but they kept the faith and they endured and they kept running. And those same people that we all would love to be like, they're watching you. They are surrounding you, encouraging you, witnessing your story, your race. I can only imagine them going, come on, a few more steps. Don't quit. They're watching as you learn and grow. God is, is waiting for you. He's wanting to teach you, to give you the skills to endure and to overcome. So when the fatigue sets in, when the suffering comes, remember that, that God has participated with us in our suffering. Look at what Jesus did and what he went through. Just as he did with Jesus, you know, he's going to transform that suffering into something that will help you become far greater than you could have ever imagined. So endure, push through, you're not alone. Because those who have come before are watching as God writes your story, as he perfects your faith. So run with each and every step. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Remember why you run. Remember who you are running to. And remember as the pain grows, it will only make your love stronger, your spirit more faithful. So endure as God educates you, as God disciplines you. Run. I'm going to encourage you. Send this to somebody you know needs encouragement. So in 2019, Eliud Kipchoge, uh, Kipchoge decided to do something the world had never seen. So he started to train. He knew exactly what he wanted to do and why he was going to do it. So he started to run. He started to train. Every day he got up and ran. He trained. He endured the difficulty, the loneliness, the fatigue. His goal was to run a marathon in under two hours. It had never been done before. In the history of humanity that we know of, So in Vienna, Austria, he runs the race of his life to prove there are no limits to what a person can accomplish if they're focused and they don't lose sight of the goal. So as he began the race, he remembered his family, his wife, he remembers his children, he remembered the ones who have gone before, his parents, his coach, and as he ran, the people came. What's interesting is he's the only one running. Now, granted, he's got a group that will join him for a couple of miles each. But everyone's come to watch Eliud Kipchoge. So they lined the 26.2 miles just to catch a glimpse 
of the one running the race of his life. He wasn't alone as he ran those 26 miles. He kept up a pace of a four and a half minute mile, 26.2 times, never losing sight of his purpose. So let's watch and see what it's like as someone finishes their race. Shalane, a final this thought from you. This is incredible. Elliot's performance is such a gift to the world. His running is a gift to all of us. I feel so blessed to be here today. I feel like, I hope everyone can hear me smiling through this microphone right now. I cannot stop smiling. 500 meters to go. He has the Hauptalli to himself. He's All the pacemakers have let him go. As Ed said, he is sprinting into the history books here. They're cheering him on. 400 meters to go. Let's bring him home. This is history unfolding on the streets of Vienna this morning. It's a Saturday run like we've never seen before. Listen at the noise, the crowd getting right behind him. Goodness me, 300 meters to go. He can see the finish line here. Neil Armstrong we had on the moon in 1969. We had Roger Bannister, the four minute mile 65 years ago. Edmund Hillary, the first man to climb Everest in 1953. We have one minute to go. Elliot Kipchoge is on his way here. This humble, this humble farmer who used to run two miles to school every day and back. He used to go to the nearest town on his bike to sell milk at the local market. And now, through hard work and discipline, he's pointing. Come on, he says. Elliot Kipchoge has the hand of history on his shoulder. He has less than 200 meters to go. Elliot Kipchoge, let's keep an eye on the clock. Into the final 20 seconds. Elliot Kipchoge. On his shoulder, 140, oh, oh, oh. 140, the unofficial oh, time. There's his wife. Elliot, Elliot Kipchoge storms into the history books in Vienna. 159.40, the unofficial time. The first man to run a marathon in under two hours. running. I think all the difficulty has a purpose. And if you let him, God will transform it into something beautiful. Don't quit running. There are people cheering you on. There's a goal. So keep your eyes on Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this moment. Help us to be people who continue to run. Help us to be focused. Help us to be people who can endure difficulty and struggle knowing that you are showing us how to be sons and daughters of God. So in those moments when we, would resert, when we would revert to bitterness, when we would revert to anger, help us instead to ask, what are we needing to know? How can you help us become people who love as a first responder? Thank you. And I pray for those, Lord, who have quit because it's too difficult. I pray that you would surround them with people who can run alongside them as they make the race and journey and fight of their life. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand together. We have men and women, our elders and their wives are around the room. We would love to pray with you. Let's sing. We have an anchor that keeps the soul Steadfast and sure while the billows roll, fastened to the rock which can.